today I'd like to continue the, some of the reminders and reflections that we started talking about last week when we were talking about Qarun and the advice that his people had given him. A quick recap and some of the things I didn't cover last time that I think are important to review. Allah, the, the first advice that Allah recorded of these people is don't be overjoyed, meaning don't go from one thrill to the next to the next. Sikhu, I think people are having trouble hearing in the back if you can adjust the volume for them. Inshallah, fix the mic up, okay. So, he says, لا تفرح إن الله لا يحب الفريحين. Don't be overjoyed, meaning don't go from one thrill to the next, to the next, to the next. And the, the point of that, the idea behind that was, as I mentioned to you yesterday, some people, or last week, some people, they go from one party to the next, one game to the next. Like, we do this with our kids. They're just watching one episode of something, then they want the next episode, then they want the next episode, and the next episode. And they become junkies in front of a TV station, or, or TV channel, or whatever show or of a video game, or online gaming, or social media. It's just one high after the next, after the next. Oh, this is gonna make me momentarily happy. Some people can watch useless videos of, I don't know, cats playing the piano or something for eight hours, and their day will go by. This is actually, When people have no concerns left, they're wealthy, or their needs are met, they don't have to go out and earn a living, they don't have to take care of responsibilities, they get a lot of free time. And when they get a lot of free time, they start getting spoiled and start wasting their time. So what do young people do sometimes? When their parents are providing the, the income and they're taking care of the household and they're, do, they're doing all the responsibilities, well then they got a lot of free time. So they're just moving from one, you know, entertaining experience to the next, to the next, to the next. You have kids in, in this calling out the youth is important just as it is calling out the elders. Whoever does wrong should be called out, myself included. So you have, you know, parents paying their children's college tuition. And your parents are paying your tuition, you're taking three or four or five classes in college, and you're not really putting any effort into it. You haven't even decided what major to do yet. You're in between classes, you're hanging out, skipping homework assignments and all of it. That's an amana, your parents paid for this. This is on you. You have to take care of it, but you feel like you can just, you know, don't toss it away because you don't feel any sense of responsibility. All of your needs are taken care of. You know, a young man who you give them a car, you just hand them a new car because they graduated. The way they're going to treat that car is garbage. As opposed to that same young man, if he worked hard and saved a little bit of money and bought an old busted old car that you wouldn't even look at twice, he's going to treat it like a queen. Why? Because it, it came with a sense of responsibility. Sometimes Allah gives wealth and luxury and that instead of becoming a blessing, it becomes a poison. And so the advice that people are giving Qarun is he's got a lot of money, but now it seems he's just going from one joyous thing to the other and he's happy about what he's got. There's no real gratitude left. And that's a real fear we have to have for our children and ourselves also. Are we becoming those kinds of people? And it's not just about, you know, movies and video games and parties and all of those things. Sometimes people think that they're doing something religious and it's shallow also. They go from one, you know, halaqa setting to another halaqa setting to another, and it, in the name of Islam, but it's not really Islam, it's just sitting there backbiting, and say they're judging pe what kind of food people cook. It's just a social event and nothing more, but it feels Islamic, <laughs> you know? Allah knows the difference between what's genuinely building somebody's akhirah, and what we're doing that's actually got poison mixed in with it. So let's not delude ourselves. You know, sometimes people assume that they are righteous, and Allah says, لا تزكوا أنفسكم don't declare yourselves righteous. Don't think that yourselves are pure. He knows better who has taqwa or not. So this first advice as a quick review and then the logical progression of this advice is pretty powerful. There are five items here and I hope to cover all five today in quick succession. He says, or they say to him, Simple. Whatever Allah has given you, put it to use and pursue the next life with it. What in the world does that mean? That means everything you and I do in our waking moments, we have an opportunity to get something for this life and the next life at the same time. If you're gonna go get halal work, not only are you making money for paying the bills, but you're also doing an act of worship. So you're actually building your next life while you're building this life. So any free time you and I have, if we can start investing that time in a way to think to ourselves, what can I do that benefits me here? but also benefits me in the next life. Many scholars looked at this ayah and said, this also means from whatever Allah has given you, think about what more and more and more you can give to Allah for your akhirah account. 
Some of you may have heard me talk about this before. Everybody here knows the concept of a bank account. When you put things in a bank account, and sometimes you have different kinds of accounts, like a retirement account. When you put money in a retirement account, you can't just take it out. You gotta wait 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years, whatever long it is. So that money, is it's yours, but you can't touch it. It's yours, but you can't touch it. Spending for your next life is exactly like that. When, when you give something in charity, when you help somebody with a loan, when you help somebody who's you know, a widow or an orphan, or when you take care of a family, anonymous, when you do these kinds of things, when you help build a masjid or you help support some, you know, some good cause, when you do these kinds of things, you're actually not giving to anybody else. You just transfer funds. You know how you do transfer between accounts? It's all it is. You transfer from your dunya account into your akhira account. That's all that is. It's still your account. It's nobody else's account. You didn't lose any money. That's why the Prophet ﷺ used to say, مَا نَقَصَ مَالٌ مِنْ صَدَقَةٌ Money doesn't go down because of charity. First of all, Allah will give you more in this life. But on top of that, what you give has actually not been lost at all. That was your own deposit for yourself. That was for your retirement account in the Akhirah. And every, everything you spend gets multiplied at least 700 times. At least. The Qur'an's guarantee. You know? فِي كُلِّ سُنْبُلَةٍ مِئَةُ حَبَّةٍ so the advice being given to him is Allah has given you a lot, but this a lot that Allah has given us in this world is basically going to be worthless in a few years. Think about that for a moment. Whatever Allah has given, if Allah has given you a beautiful house, if you have amazing clothes, if you have great savings, if you have a great education, great job, great social status, if you have the best of the best of this life, how long do you have it? How long before it's gone? And if it's not gone, you're gone. The house will still be there. You'll be in the, in the backyard buried. The house is still there. The bedroom's still really nice. The living room's re still really beautiful. The car's still there. We're not there anymore. So Allah wants us to build something truly for the future. Truly, truly for the future. So He says, yes, have good things in this life, but make sure that it's a double investment. It benefits you here and it benefits you in the next life. And if you and I start asking ourselves that question, what I'm doing right now, is it something that's giving me some kind of happiness here, but it's maybe hurting my next life? Or is it something that's good here and good there at the same time? Ah, that changes our course of behavior quite a bit. It changes our actions quite a bit. You, you, the choices you make start changing. That's the second advice he's being given. But how is it connected to the first advice? The first advice was don't just be overjoyed looking for one thrill to the next to the next. Because when people just want to entertain themselves, they don't think about the long term. They're only thinking about having fun right now. They just want to feel happy. Farah. Inna Allah la yuhibbul farihin. Someone who just wants to be happy doesn't want to think about tomorrow or next week or next year or 10 years from now. They don't want to think about that. They're thinking about right now. Man, I just want to have a good weekend. It's Friday night. What do you want me to do? That's all they're thinking about. And so Allah gives us through this advice the ability to think ahead. When you think ahead and you make good choices, then you get better here, get better things here and in the next life. This is actually the dua all of you know really well. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Give us the best in this life and the next life. That doesn't mean give me Jannah here and Jannah there. It means give me the ability of doing good things here, the good things that will build my next life there. So those two things become one. They're not two separate things. You're building your Akhirah and building your dunya are not two separate things. They become one thing. They're not separated at all. And that's the beauty of our religion. We don't have to separate them. And so that's the second item that they, they advise him to. Let's move on to the third. Now, you, when you talk about the afterlife and building the afterlife, somebody starts thinking, well, you don't want me to have, what should I have for this life? And the, the balancing portion of this ayah is, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا And I talked to you very little about that last time. Don't forget your portion from worldly life, from this life. Allah, in this ayah, not only should you build your akhirah, you should take care of yourself. Now what is your portion? There's a portion that, what that means is you should take care of your health. You should eat right. You shouldn't just be, you know, sacrificing yourself and thinking you're doing something for the sake of Allah. No, you, there are some rights that Allah, you, this body is not yours. Just like your money isn't yours, this body isn't yours. So taking care of it is a responsibility Allah gave you. So if you're eating unhealthy food, and you're eating processed sugars day in and day out. And then you say Allah has tested me with diabetes. It ain't Allah who tested you, bro. You're testing Allah's, the amana Allah gave you with poison. 
you fed it poison and then you're surprised that you have clogged arteries after 20 years of biryani you know and then and and you're going for heart problems and all all of these things why because we're we're forgetting our portion in this dunya just the same way physically our body has rights over us the same way emotionally there's rights that you have you know it's remarkable allah does not want us to be miserable for his sake Allah says about His laws, listen to this carefully. He says about His laws, Allah wants to lighten your burden for you. Every law Allah gave you is to make your life easier. He didn't make any laws that benefit Him. He only made laws of halal and haram and fard. You better do this, you better stay away from this, you are allowed to do this. All of those laws, they only benefit who? You. To make your life easier. And Allah does not want anyone to be miserable. No one should be miserable. No one should feel like they're sacrificing their happiness or what they need or you know, the, you know, themselves, a part of themselves for the sake of Allah. That's not our religion. Allah wants us to have the best of this life and the next life. I say this because what, what, what I'm about to say, you have to listen to carefully. Sometimes people sacrifice their happiness or their rights or their dignity and they live a miserable life because, and they do it not even for Allah, they do it for someone else. They do it for someone else. They sacrifice their dignity for someone else. And they tell themselves they're doing it for Allah. So here you have someone being humiliated by a spouse. It could be a, 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 a wife humiliating a husband. It could be a husband humiliating a wife. It could be parents humiliating children or children humiliating parents. And each of them is thinking, I should be patient for the sake of Allah. That's not for the sake of Allah. Allah never allowed for you to be humiliated. Allah never allowed for your rights to be taken. And nobody gets to tell you you should just have sabr. Because that's what Allah wants. Allah doesn't want to tolerate abuse for you. Allah doesn't want you to feel miserable even for His own sake. Who's you, who are you going to put, put above Allah? That you should tolerate that for. So the advice says, don't forget your portion in this life. There are things that you have the right to do. You know, sometimes I hear these things that are part of so many Muslim cultures that my head goes for a spin, like what religion is this that we, we say we believe in and what do we actually do? Like the, the other day I was talking to a, you know, uh, talking about a, a young couple. They got, they have in, 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 this is a Pakistani thing. Other cultures may not be able to relate, but I want to tell you some, some of the things we do, we crazy. So I'll tell you some of the stuff we do. They get, they get their, their son and daughter, or they, they get this, this boy married because he wants to marry this girl and they want to make sure they're you know, on the halal side of things. So they get the nikah done. Okay, the nikah is done, but we're not going to let our daughter leave the house. Nikah is done, but she still lives with the father. And the husband says, hey, let's go out to dinner. No, 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 you're not going with him. You, this, you live under my house. What kind of insanity is this? And then the daughter is crying and saying, um, I feel like I'm disobeying my father. And this, the straight answer to that is, by the way, the straight answer is, when nikah happens, the rights belong to the husband and the wife. Nobody has a say in that. You're putting, the, uh, even a father getting to say that is putting himself about, above Allah's law. Who are you to tell people what to do? When Allah has given them that right. That, you know, and so we come up with these laws that superimpose and make things difficult and people say, no, 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 but I should respect my parents. Yeah, you should, but you shouldn't violate your own rights. You shouldn't do that because once you do that, once you start messing with Allah's laws, when you start twisting them to your preferences or your cultural preferences or your own priorities, when you start bending Allah's laws, that is when shaitan comes in. That is when horrible things happen inside families because then the lightness of the burden goes away and we put heavier and heavier and heavier burdens on ourselves. Allah gave us this law to remove from us the burdens and the chains and the fetters that used to be on us. Sometimes our own minds, our own culture, our own society, it puts burdens on us and Allah removes those burdens. Don't forget your portion in this life. If Allah has made something halal for you, nobody can make you feel guilty about it. If Allah has given you certain rights, nobody else can take them away. If Allah has not given somebody certain rights, they cannot assume that they have those rights. This does, our religion doesn't work that way. لا تنسى نصيبك من الدنيا Take care of your portion in this life. Be respectful about it. I'm not saying you listen to this and go back home and start fights. I'm not saying that. 
But understand something, if you don't take care of yourself, how are you going to take care of anything else? If you start breaking on the inside for the sake of Allah, like you tell yourself, human beings weren't wired that way. Allah has a certain nature in everything. If you take a plant and you want it to grow, you have to give it water. You stop giving it water and you say, I made so much dua, it's still not growing. Dua is not going to grow that plant, it needs water. Allah made human beings with a certain kind of nature, certain kinds of needs. When those needs are not taken care of, they're going to break. They're going to do messed up things. They're going to fall apart. And then they're no good to themselves and they're no good to anybody else. So لا تنسى نصيبك من الدنيا But if you do take care of your portion, if you are able to stand up for your rights, if you are able to stand up for your dignity, if you're able to do that, and if you can, st if you can do that, then the next portion of the advice comes, which is وَأَحْسِنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ It's such powerful advice. He says, do your very best and do beautifully. One of the ways to translate أَحْسِنْ is do beautifully. The way Allah did beautifully towards you. Do your very best like Allah did His best towards you. What in the world does that mean? That means that you develop a positive attitude. First, in simple terms, you are constantly thinking about the gifts that Allah has given you. I'm thinking about the opportunities that Allah has given me, the chance that Allah has given me, the health that Allah has given me, the strength that He's given me, the mind that He's given me, the money that He's given me, the, the opportunity and the society in which I'm living. The times in which he decided that I should be born. You know, some people say silly things like, I feel like I was born for a different era and I'm living in the wrong. No, you're, Allah is pretty sure you belong in this era. You can feel like it because you've been watching a lot of old TV shows and you feel like you belong in the 12th century, but maybe you should stop watching TV and live in this era because Allah created you for this time and you should be grateful for the time and the environment and the situation you live in. Maybe you're surrounded by darkness. And you say, why am I surrounded by darkness? Why am I in such a bad environment? Maybe because you were supposed to be the light that came in that environment. Maybe you're, you were put in darkness because you're supposed to be that light. After all, a believer is called a lamp. And a lamp is only beneficial at nighttime when there's darkness. You know, the believer's heart is called a lamp, right? And so there's, there's a, maybe there's a reason you're in this situation. Because you're supposed to be a, sort of good, you know, a source of good. First, you take care of yourself. Then you start doing good to all around. Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi when talking about this ayah said, Allah did not just limit doing good as in charity. Do good with your tongue. Say the best thing to, things to people. Think about how you talk to people. Think about the tone you're going to take. Avoid sarcasm. Say beautiful things, not ugly things. Don't, don't mock people. Don't look at people with ugly faces. You know, don't scoff at people. Don't talk behind people's back. When people see you, they have beautiful thoughts. They have a beautiful experience even if they saw you for 2 seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Nobody's miserable because of you. You're not a source of misery, you're a source of joy. And why are you a source of joy? For yourself and others, because Allah has been good to you. كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ As if Allah is telling us, we have to become better human beings in everything that we do. You're the best at your work, you're the best in your studies, you're the best in the way you carry yourself, you're the best in the choice of words you use, you're the best at controlling your temper, you're, do, you're doing the best on every single front. Why? Because you keep thinking, Allah has been pretty good to me. Allah has taken quite a bit of care of me. What does shaitan want you to do? Shaitan wants you to think about all your problems and blame them on Allah. Why did Allah do this to me? Why is my brother taller than I am? Why is this happening to me? Why did that happen to me? I can't forget that one time somebody said this one thing. Yep, that happened. But all the good that's happened in between, He wants you to be blind to. Allah wants you to think about how Allah is good to you. Ahsin kama ahsan Allahu ilayk. And Allah is still good to you. No matter how hard your life and my life is, there is someone who has it much harder. And I've seen people that have a much harder life and they are happy. They are happy because they recognize Allah is good to them. I'm, I'm reminded that still, it, it, the image is imprinted in my mind. I was in Chiapas in Mexico and I was in a village, the whole village had become Muslim. The entire village took Shahada and it took like, after a, a, you know, a, a flight from Mexico City, it was about a two hour drive on a road that's not a road. So the car was like this for two hours. And then we get to this village and this village, everybody became Muslim. Subhanallah. And so I'm, and, and those people don't even speak Spanish. So they have their own language and they had to have an interpreter. What I was saying was in English, then the interpreter was tr translating into Spanish and then another interpreter was translating it into their language. That's how I would be able to speak to them. And some of these people, they invited me into their home and I want you to just think about what I saw. They invite me into their home. Their home was, you know, have you seen like in Home Depot out here or some of these backyards, they have those sheds? 
Their home was the size of a shed, maybe eight foot by eight foot, that is their house. And it, the, the outside of it is literally planks of wood of different sizes that they gathered. That's the walls of the house. The, the roof of the house was tin foil. The floor of the house was dirt. It was dirt. The kitchen was a propane tank. That's all it was, a propane tank. And they twist it and a fire comes out and they cook on top of that. There's no stove. The, the, the tank is the stove. And he's giving me a tour of his house. And he's so happy. And he says, this is where we sit. And this, and he moves some curtains and behind it is a bunch of newspapers on the wall. And this is where my children sleep. How many children do you have? I have three children. This is about uh, maybe two thirds the size of a single bed. And this is where my three children sleep. And then he moves the curtain again. And this is where I sleep. <laughs> and he's happy. And his kid runs in. One of them has pants on and no shirt. The other one has a shirt and no pants. Because that's all the clothes they have. But they looked happy. Man, did they look happy. And then you come back. And then you see kids. And you go into their room and you cannot step two steps without stepping on a toy or books flying around or oh, I don't want to do my homework or what's for lunch? Oh God, do we have this? We only have orange juice? I want apple juice. We have those kids and they're miserable. They're all, and then you, can I go to the party on the weekend? No, you can't. You never let me do anything. I have, so, I have the worst life. This, this is, you know, this is Ahsin Kama Ahsan Allahu Ilaik. Those people can see that Allah is good to them. And Allah has given us more, many of us more, than most people will dream of. Than most people will dream of and miserable. Miserable. He says, Wa ahsin kama ahsan Allahu ilayk. Be good to people, be good to others, take care of yourself, take care of your needs, but become one who cares for others. And that, and that should be inspired by how Allah, how Allah has been good to you and to me. If we can do that, then we can save ourselves from being Qarun. And we can stop ourselves from being entitled. You know, it's, uh, you know, last thing I'll share with you about this individual, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. In the Quran, Allah talks about terrible nations. Yes? The nation of Fir'aun, the nation of Lut, the nation of Salih, those nations. And the whole nation was evil. And Allah destroyed those nations, didn't He? And He destroyed them in this life. And then they have punishment in? The next life, two times. Qarun is not a nation. Qarun is one man. And his attitude, you know what his attitude is? I have everything because I'm pretty knowledgeable. And you know what Allah did with him? He's not a nation. He's one man. And Allah buried him into the ground. Along with his house. He buried him in the ground. Allah punished him not in the next life. Allah punished him in this life. The story is being told to us because this, the advice that's being given, if this advice is not followed, then we become like Qarun. And if we become like Qarun, we're not that much safer than Qarun. We're not that much safer. If Qarun can be buried into the earth in this life, and then in the next life, then we don't have any insurance policy against that. We don't have any way that we'll know that Allah will not bring us to our knees and destroy us because of our arrogance, because of our ingratitude in this life before we even see anything in the next. And I pray Allah protects us from becoming a Qarun on the inside. These are, not, these are not just people who came and they died. These people had a disease and that disease lives on until judgment day. That's why Allah described this virus. So you read about it, I read about it, I think about it, I hear about it, and I say to myself, man, I better not be infected with this virus because that's scary stuff. I don't want it for myself. I don't want my kids to have it. And what can we do to get it out of our system? If we see some of this inside of ourselves, if I see some of this inside of my, what can I do? What can I, how can I make choices that benefit me in this life and the next life? How can I become a person that stops just entertaining themselves and getting lost in social media and video games and movies and all this nonsense? Yeah, have some fun sometimes, but if that's all your life has become, which way are you headed? Which way am I headed? May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us and may Allah Azza wa Jal protect our next generation and may Allah Azza wa Jal keep our eyes open and never let us believe that this world is all there is, that there is a much bigger reality ahead and Allah is always watching. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.